McKinsey's doing. Looks like he's still working. So I'm going to discuss so endovascular aneurysm pair cases or a case I wish I'd never performed. These are my disclosures relevant to this discussion. Um, so I'm going to show you a case of an 84-year-old male, um, relatively ill uh, individual, presenting electively for a AAA repair, past medical history for hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, COPD, but not on HOMO2, uh, prior MI and, and two prior percutaneous interventions. Um, he on physical exam, he was obese, uh, relatively frail, but living independently, normal vitals, palpable abdominal mass. Uh, on his angiogram, he had a 6.2 centimeter infrarenal AAA with a, a, a aneurysms of both iliac arteries, a smaller one on the right and a, and a larger one on the left. Uh, angulated neck, about two centimeters long, and I'll show you an angio of that, but I don't have the CTs, but um, about a two centimeter angulated neck. His uh, iliac arteries were calcified, but more importantly than that, they were um, very tortuous. Uh, and his left hypogastric artery was occluded. So uh, this just shows his, his initial aortogram, and you can see a fair amount of angulation, but a nice straight segment of neck here that's at least two centimeters long, so we felt we could get a proximal seal there. Uh, planned to use a, a, a gore excluder with an IBD device to preserve this hypogastric over here, as this one was patent, although this one was occluded. So we we're going to extend down into the external on this side and, and preserve this one with a, with a uh, hypogastric IBD device. So this is our initial uh, aortogram, uh, and we did runoff imaging. Um, got wire access bilaterally and tried to establish uh, um, a uh, Lundquist wire access, uh, Amplatz or Lundquist up this, this side. And you can see that one of the challenges here is this severe tortuosity of the external iliac artery. So not a lot of occlusive disease, but a fair amount of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, tortuosity. Had trouble getting the Lundquist up. I was able to get a, a floppy wire, a floppy glide, then a stiff glide, and a catheter all the way up to the proximal aorta, but really couldn't get a Lundquist to track through here because of this tortuosity. So what we did instead is put a, a stiff access, a stiff wire up the opposite side, got a large uh, sheath in place. I believe this is a 12 French sheath, so we're prepared for any issues. Um, and then tried a telescoping sheath uh, approach here um, in which we put a stiff angle glide wire um, through a, uh, our large sheath, so we had our, I believe it was an 18 or 20 French sheath here. Through that, we telescoped an 8 French sheath, and this coaxial system will allow us to straighten out this, this uh, iliac and eventually get our, our stiff wire up through this system. Unfortunately, upon um, advancing this 8 French sheath and telescoping it through the uh, larger sheath, that's when we everything, everything sort of straightened out nicely and we thought we were in good shape but then sudden onset of hypertension to the 60s. And so um, this is, this is uh, obviously never, uh, some cases you'd rather have not performed are ones where you've caused a rupture yourself or you've caused a, a problem that, that you otherwise would have liked to avoid. And so our first angiogram through this sheath that we now had in position definitely showed a, a fair amount of extravasation um, through the, the, the junction of the external iliac to the common iliac. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to uh, point out a couple uh, issues here. Obviously, this tortuosity is, is one of the problems in terms of risk factors for iliac rupture uh, or evulsion or longitudinal tear of that iliac artery. Uh, severe iliac tortuosity is, is probably one of the most, more important issues, uh, certainly with the external iliac, which is probably the most rupture-prone artery in the body. Uh, iliac calcification and occlusive disease just add to that problem. So this was a fairly predictable uh, outcome um, when pushing pretty hard with these stiff wires and coaxial uh, sheath systems. Um, and luckily, because we anticipated that, we, we were in position to deal with this. Um, this I'm just going to jump back a step and, and bring up some, um, some points uh, in terms of dealing with ruptured e ERs, uh, ruptured uh, aneurysms. Obviously, most of us handle these in an endovascular way at this point. Um, and some of this, once you have an intraoperative complication, you need to fall back on those same principles you use for a rupture. And, and uh, this is some of the, these are some of the issues I talk to my own fellows about, the do's and don'ts of dealing with ruptures in the emergency room. You do want large bore access. You want to be able to give blood products, but you don't want to slam those blood products in. So you want to communicate with your anesthesiologist in the operating room. You want to get blood available. You want to allow some permissive hypotension rather than, than increasing the pressure head and increasing the bleeding. Uh, don'ts in the ER with a rupture, um, some of which apply to the, uh, the operating room as well, is you don't mess around with sedating the patient, intubating patient, um, putting in lines and catheters to, to, um, to monitor with the exception of um, putting in uh, devices to give transfusions. And the real key in dealing with a rupture in the emergency room is just to get that patient to your hybrid OR or cath lab where you're, you're going to deal with, um, deal with the, the problem at hand. And again, the, the issues there, uh, some of which are applicable to an intraoperative complication like this, is to communicate with your anesthesiologist, get blood available, allow some permissive hypotension. Um, and then really the, the key here is getting your aortic occlusion balloon in place. And so 
because of the anticipation of this sort of problem, we, we had a large bore sheath on the other side all ready to go. Um, because I was able to get our, our sheath in position with this maneuver that ruptured the iliac, because I was able to get the sheath there, I decided to put an occlusion balloon in this iliac artery uh, rather than going up to the, the, um, the aorta itself, which would have been another option. But this allowed us to sort of get control here and then proceed with our aneurysm repair and the definitive uh, solution to this problem. So once the uh, balloon is inflated here, shot an angiogram through the contralateral sheath just to make sure we had control, which we did. Um, we saw uh, after injecting through the, the, um, the ruptured side, we still had continued uh, bleeding from the hypogastric artery there. Uh, went ahead and proceeded with the aneurysm repair. At this point, we'd given up on doing the IBD on this ipsilateral side or this ruptured side and decided instead just to coil that side or, or just to exclude it if necessary. Um, put up our, our bifurcated endograft uh, to the um, proximal aorta, deployed this down to the iliac, the left common iliac as well, um, deployed another limb down into the external iliac. As if you recall, this, right, this left hypogastric was occluded already, so we were just going to extend down to the left external, which we did there. At this point, we can now remove the seclusion balloon after placing one up in the, uh, in the endograft itself. So this shows a, um, an occlusion balloon up in the, the main body of the endograft. Um, at this point, we can now deflate our balloon that's in the uh, ipsilateral or ruptured side, cannulate the contralateral gate uh, through the right ipsy side or the, the right iliac side, deflate our balloon to get our wire up into the descending thoracic aorta and reinflate the balloon to get control again. So this now allows us to have our bifurcated device inside. We've cannulated the gate. We've got our proximal occlusion as well to controlling everything. And then at this point, you know, we again shot through the sheath and continued to see hypogastric extravas or extravasation through the hypogastric or through back bleeding. Um, and because the patient was fairly stable at this point, we resuscitated him a, a bit and had, um, had, had him pretty stable through the last uh, number of steps that I just outlined. So decided to try to deal with this hypogastric artery. And to do this, we, we double punctured the common femoral artery. He had a generous common femoral here. So I was able to puncture that, get another um, sheath and catheter uh, into that common femoral, snake a catheter into the hypogastric artery using a renegade catheter to, to um, super select this hypogastric. We then coil embolize the, the, uh, um, the hypogastric. Uh, so as once we completed our repair, we would have less of a risk of ongoing bleeding and, and issues of abdominal compartment syndrome and those sort of problem. So once this coil embolization was done, it's fairly straightforward to finish extending our endograft limb into the external, and, and now we have control of both sides, no evidence of ongoing bleeding, and good exclusion of the aneurysm itself. So um, uh, these are some of the key steps to dealing with an intraoperative complication in the same way that the, the you want to deal with an, an ER com or an, a rupture coming up from the ER. Um, and obviously, a, a case like this, I will say, if you're, if you're trying asked to describe your, your case you really wish you hadn't done, I feel a little bit like I'm in, in an interview where someone asks you, what are your weaknesses? And you say, oh, I just work too hard, and it makes me neglect other things. Uh, obviously, this outcome was a, a good outcome. The patient went home the next day and was pretty well preserved. Um, when I think back about the EVAR cases uh, that I really wish I hadn't done, these are a couple that come to mind. Um, a 67-year-old male with a, a juxtarenal AAA, which I thought would be an appropriate patient, patient for a ZFEN. Um, and then a couple of patients in which we did physician-modified uh, fenestrated grafts for type 4 thoracos, one of which had an extremely low EF, another with a history of a lobectomy. Uh, each of these patients pretty uh, independently living and pretty functional, but really if you look at their comorbidities, you see they're substantial. Um, we've gotten pretty facile with using fenestrated technology like the ZFEN. These pictures are being shown by Darren. Um, this is an example of a back table modified case we did. And these, this is what some of our patients look like. So this is one of our patients who had a, a four-hour fenestrated case, looked like that the next morning on rounds at 6 a.m., went home that same day, and, or next, the next day, the day after the procedure, so on post-op day no, number one. So with this new technology and with the minimally invasive nature of this, we really can sort of push the envelope to some degree, and, I, and that's what we do. Uh, and that's, that's where I think I've gotten into some trouble. And so going back to these three patients, I'll point out that uh, this 67-year-old this healthy male that could have had an open repair is exactly the patient that Darren just talked about with a posterior bulge at the, at the uh, perirenal level. And, and this is one of those areas which I'm now very cautious about because he had a persistent type 1 endoleak, which ultimately led to an explant for him. These other two patients are patients that had a technically perfect four-vessel fenestrated case with a back table modified graft ranging between five, four, to four, four to five hours of operative time, and each of them went into multi-organ failure with no, no particularly good cause other than the ischemia, reperfusion, and the, uh, and the and somewhat frail nature of these patients. So when I think about cases I really wish I hadn't done, I think of these, these physician failure uh, issues rather than device or, or uh, aortic issues. 
So I think that uh, we have technology creeping into questionable cases at times. Uh, lessons that learned that I've lessons I've learned within um, uh, some of the more challenging cases and and with this new technology is try to keep within the IFU uh, patient selection remains uh, patient selection remains of paramount importance and patient frailty is an important thing that we're seeing is correlating with outcome uh, and importantly have an appropriate plan device and skill set uh, to deal with what should be anticipated complications during these difficult cases thank you